Oops. Okay, it's recording. <coughs> okay, we started with the question of uh, laws of structure, laws of language structure in the last session. And uh, what we did was uh, take a look at word internal structure. So we looked at cases like uh, uh, happy is a word, and you can attach nest to it. Happy is an adjective, and nest can go with this to create uh, another word. But if you take joy, you can't attach nest to it because joy is a noun, whatever this is. And there's a constraint on nest which says you can attach nest only to adjectives. So this structure is well formed. Well formed means it obeys the constraints that we have set up, and this is ill formed. So this is rejected. That was the kind of loss that we set up in the last session. <coughs> So we looked at affixes like ness, li, um, less, and so on, large number of them. What I want to do now is to move from word internal structure to sentence structures. So a level larger than that of words. Uh, let me remind you that what we are trying to do is look at the structure or the structural laws that exist inside the mind. So we are looking at the mental linguistic system as part of the human mind. There is a linguistic system, the system of vision, the system of reasoning. So you are thinking about mind as being composed of various modules, and this is one of the modules of mind. That's the conception we're going by. And this module, on the one hand, uh, is an emergent property of the brain. So we can look at the brain and make inferences about this. And on the other side, we look at behavior. <clears throat> so the strategy that we're going to pursue is look at what, whatever we can observe in terms of brain, whatever we can observe in terms of behavior. This we cannot directly observe. So we try to guess what could be inside. This is a kind of black box. <clears throat> Initially, when linguistics started in 50, 1957, that is the birth of linguistics. Um, and by linguistics, I mean the kind of linguistics that I do. Of course, there was another kind of linguistics before that. but. Uh, we don't recognize that as linguistics. <coughs> was based on this alone. Because we didn't, at that time, we didn't know enough about the brain to make guesses about language at that point, at that time. <coughs> what kind of behavior do we look at? One of the kind of behavior that we looked at is judgment behavior. What that means is you input certain kinds of stimuli so stimulus A, and uh, you get the response. Uh, when I say stimulus, I don't mean brain here. I mean to uh, in input to behavior. And the response is yes. And then you vary this slightly, and you input stimulus A prime, and the response is no. We have to control these two stimuli very carefully. And then you can ask, what is the reason for this difference relating, uh, giving, your, giving rise to this difference? What is it in here that gives you this difference? That's the central question we're going to ask. This is, this is the kind of staple strategy that goes into theoretical linguistics. A large part of theoretical linguistics is of this type. That's what I'm going to use initially. 
you could also combine it with other kinds of experimental strategies, but this is a uh, stateful strategy. And then we construct laws. We set up laws here to explain this behavioral difference. So here is a, an easy example. Uh, we can say that boy adores uh, those uh, books. So here is the counterpart of A prime. And if you give this sentence to reasonably fluent speakers of English, they'll say yes. And this yes means that sounds okay, acceptable to me. But if you say boy that adores those books, they'll say no. All that we did was to exchange these two words. And in this case, one way of stating this will be to state a law that says uh, boy cannot perceive that. That will work because here boy follows that, here boy precedes that. But that is not going to work when you look at large number of cases because this will also be true about that girl adores those books, that dog adores those books, and so on and so on. So what you do is to say, instead of saying boy, you say noun. And instead of saying that, because this will also be true about this, this, uh, and so on, you say this is what is called a determinant. Doesn't matter what the word is. So I'm assign some category. Right. You could call it whatever, alpha and beta if you want. The boy that was clear yesterday also. Hold on for a sec. I'm, I'm doing five finger exercises. I'll come to the boy that was killed and so on. In fact, that's exactly what I want to do. This is, this is, the, the rule is not correct, but let me build up slowly. Uh, so nouns cannot precede determinants is the... Uh, no, uh, you don't have to define because the reason why I don't have to define is the number of words in any mental lexicon is finite. So you can make a list mental lexicon. And by lexicon, I mean the mental counterpart of a dictionary. And we make some differences, some distinctions between dictionaries and lexicons. But let me right now use the word lexicon to mean roughly the same as dictionary. The whole idea is that in order to learn a language, you have to know the words of the language. We memorize the language. Memorize the words, but we cannot memorize all the possible sentences. Okay, so in your mental lexicon, yeah. What's the definition of finite you are using in the finite means even if it's a large number, it could be 10,000. You know, it is not infinite, in the sense it's not never ending. So one sense of infinite is like, even if you count the number of stars, there are always new stars which you can count. In a parallel to language, there are new words that come and they keep on adding. Yeah. So it's not exactly a finite quantity. So what sense do you mean by finite? Okay. Now, I, when I was referring to this, I used the word were. Okay. That's a slight, slight inaccurate, slightly inaccurate use. What I meant by this is actually a morphine. So, uh, even if the number of words you can create more and more, uh, by, for example, I, can say, I have a word morphine black, and I can say uh, board, and I can combine the two into blackboard, and I can now add eraser, and blackboard eraser is a word, compound word. And in that sense, I'm not referring to the individual pieces I'm referring when I say word, I mean this complex thing. However, the point is this uh, no human mind can remember how many telephone numbers can you remember. You cannot set a limit, you cannot say something like 20, 30, etc. It will be kind of unbounded in that sense, you can always increase. But then at any one point of time, you have 
finite number of words. If you want to learn a new word, you have to learn it afresh. But if you want to create a new sentence, you can always create it. Okay, so you have to, let, let me put it this way. Um, if I give you the meanings of these, these items, you can compute the meanings of sentences. You don't have to remember it. The meanings of sentences is inferable, whereas the, what a word such as red means, what a word such as black means, what a word such as boy means, you just have to memorize it. So the distinction I'm making is that which is memorized and that which doesn't have to be memorized, that, that which can be computed. So the letters of the English alphabet is exactly 26. Right? And out of these letters, you can create words, but when, when I create a word such as glyph, you don't know what glyph means. Now I have to tell you glyph means such and such. Now you memorize that. So this is simply a list of what you memorize. And I'm trying to figure out how the list of things that you memorize can be combined together. And the rules that I'm stating here are those rules. Okay, memorized and non-memorized. That again, even that is a slight uh, inaccuracy. It doesn't matter. You have to make <coughs> some broad strokes before you work out the details. We'll come to the gray areas later about what is memorized and what is not memorized. There are areas where there is a combination of what is memorized and what is not memorized. But for our purposes now, it doesn't matter. So <clears throat> we can state this law like this. Now comes the four. Determiner comes before now. Okay. So this is law number one. And that works for a small number of cases. It also work not, not simply in cases like that boy adores those books. If you try to exchange those, these two words, again, exactly the same problem. And so this law will take care of that as well, not simply at the beginning of the word. We could have said in the earlier case, when you exchange these two, uh, that, can, that can, or the determiner can exist only at the beginning of a sentence. But that will not take care of this one. Right. But this law, but this is much better than the other kinds of laws. Now, <coughs> there is, what does this mean? This means precede. This says determiner must precede noun. But does it mean nouns must always be preceded? Not really, because you can say boys and all those books. So determiners are optional. If they do exist, so you put a bracket there. Let me write this clearly. You don't need determiners. But if you have determiners and nouns, then this is the word order. There is still one more problem. What does this, what does this symbol mean? Does it mean immediately precede? Or does it mean sort of long distance precedence? If you say immediate, then what about this, that unhappy boy? And those, those, those books. So this again, <clears throat> unhappy doesn't have to exist, but it is optional. So what we're going to do is to change this to determiner is optional, adjective is optional, and then you have now. So that will take care of this as well as the preceding sentence. And gradually building up a way, a kind of notation for writing these, these laws. <clears throat> Are these only for the English language? Or? Yeah, right now only for English. For obviously for French and uh, Malay and so on, then the rule is know. the other way around. Then the next question will be, can you state laws that apply to all languages? Right now only for English and only for standard English and so on. Sure. Yeah. Actually, there's a general, okay, we, I'll ask no, you that. No, go ahead, ask. No, the generalization would be that, are these applicable only to human communication? Or are there laws of communication? 
Uh, these are, right now I'm assuming that these are That's specific it. to human language. So a brain is filtering these things. And yeah. Are, yeah. So, and the universalities of the laws that you would say are pertinent to a human brain processing these yeah. things. That's right. Now, the, the implicit in your question is, are there, let me restate it this mm -hmm. way. There are laws which are very specific to English. Yeah. And then, so English laws. And then there are laws which are specific to French, specific to Hindi, and so on. Okay. The things that we call languages. But then, within, a population of people who claim to speak the same language, there are laws that separate different groups. Subpopulations of the so-called English. Varieties of English. And there are laws that apply to these guys. And then there is the individual. So there are laws that apply to my Malayalam, which will not apply to my brother's Malayalam or my wife's Malayalam. So essentially we are, we are we are at this level. And then we go on to uh, human species. Right species. Human species. So all these are put together into a single, what we call drama. And the laws that apply to the human species are called universal drama. Universal meaning specific to the human species. So that goes from the individual to the species. In between, there are these communities. And there is some debate on whether or not this is legitimate. So if you ask someone like Chomsky, Chomsky would say, we are interested in individuals, then we are interested in the species. The thing called speech community is a confusing concept. That cannot be studied. But I'm going to assume for now that you, cannot, you can study that as well. The question that you are raising, perhaps, is the next one, right? Not the human species, but laws that apply to life forms. Um, in fact, you can go Not on necessarily life forms, but communication in general. Any form of communication. Including, for example, the language of mathematics, including the language of computer science, and so correct. on. So, okay. So this is, this is what we call natural languages. Things like English and French and German are natural languages. And the others are artificial languages. Artificial meaning it was sort of deliberately created for a purpose by a bunch of humans. So something like Fortran Actually, is that's of that not type. exactly what I meant, but mm. uh, you know, because let's say that um, instructions to do a certain thing mm. reside in, in genomic sequences, for example. Correct? Mm. And that is also a form of communication. Yeah. Correct? Right. Uh, and that is is not a man-made entity. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so I, you're I, not distinguishing between natural things and artificial things. Yeah, but you know, the artificial things I think would somehow follow all these things yeah. because, you know, yeah. the same yeah. Co you know, cognitive yeah. things go into creating yeah. the language. Yeah. So how do bacteria communicate, for example? So, so, so that, for example. Yeah, that's why I said life. Yeah. Communication in life as opposed to communication in this level. Okay. Yeah. What is the grammar of uh, the, the, the bee communication? What is the grammar of bacterial communication? Correct. And so on. You know. okay. Protein communication, all those two things. No, the, the linguists have been really drawing a boundary here. And the reason is historical because when linguistics came about in the 50s, the idea was to show that there exist laws that are very specific to human language and the universal grammar. And at that point, the battle was not easy. So we had to show that there are these idiosyncratic laws which are idiosyncratic to the human species of this type. That was well established long ago. We don't have to have that battle anymore. But once the battle starts and people get into that habit and show that again and again and again. Now the interesting thing for linguists will be to show 
that many of the things that we have postulated as laws at this level are actually deducible from the next level. Uh, I think that has only begun. That's very recent. Uh, in fact, I started saying that uh, a few years before I moved out of linguistics. And when I started saying that, people thought I was crazy. But now there are more and more people who would like to deduce most of it from elsewhere and put minimal emphasis on this one. Uh, the idea here, if you have this, then you can deduce many of these things from here. This, the same logic should apply to deduction from here to here. What is above you know, sir? Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'll give you a brief question and then I'll go back to this one. Because we move from this concrete thingy to an extremely abstract stuff. Uh, to answer that question, really, I need to illustrate some of these guys and show how it can be used from fundamental principles. Um, no, hold on that question. I cannot give you an answer unless I give you examples. I will show you how some of the laws of this type can be derived from here, and some of the laws here can actually be derived from elsewhere. There are laws that apply not only to human language organization, but also all forms of organization. And this is the kind of stuff that, all I can say is that, this is the kind of stuff that is studied by Santa Fe Institute of Complexity. They set up laws that apply across domains. And many of these laws happen to apply to linguistics as well. So it doesn't really matter whether it is language or something else. These are organizational ways the laws that apply to any organization, any natural organization. So whether it is human or bacteria, trees or humans, it doesn't really matter. So I'll try to illustrate some of those things later, but to get a feel for that, we need to actually work our way up. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So hold, hold on to that thought. Now, <clears throat> this is a kind of, this idea here is that it's a string Language structure is simply a kind of strength. Formally, what I am trying to do is what is called finite state grammar. That is to say, you go from here to here to here to here and so on in a kind of uh, string or you know, uh, Markov process. This is actually slightly more powerful, but essentially just, just a kind of string of symbols with no further structure. All structure is simply in terms of precedence relation and this kind of optionality relation. Um, I just put that in because you can look it up. Yeah. <coughs> uh, if you look it up, what I'm saying will make sense. Again, what I mean by finite state uh, will also make sense if you look it up. Actually, there's a kind of computational language uh, and the reason why I'm using this terminology is because it makes what I'm saying sufficiently clear. But I'm not going to go into the details of this. And actually part of the reason for my using those words is because this mother is sitting here, so it'll be easier, kind of shorthand, to explain something to Madhu if I use those words. <clears throat> For the present purposes, assume that I didn't use these words. Essentially, what this means is that you can think of language as being strings or symbols with no further structure. But you can easily show that couldn't be the case. And in fact, you gave an example. So suppose you say something like that boy gave uh, those girls many books. Or you can make it this way. That boy gave many girls those books. You notice that you have a noun here, and you have a determinant here, and you have a noun here, and you have a determinant here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a uh, many determinant, yeah. So this kind of rule in a linear way doesn't make a distinction between this linear order and this linear order. Here it looks as though nouns precede determiners. 
one way of taking care of that problem is to say that there's a unit like that, and there's a unit like this. And the law applies within a unit, not across units. So within this unit, the determiner precedes a noun. Within this unit, the determiner precedes a noun. So we'll call this unit a phrase. This is also a phrase. Is this a generalization of pronunciation rules also? For example, the way you would pronounce two syllables yeah. that feature in a word. If you were to screw the order up, yeah. then you get gibberish. Yeah. Well, your tongue twister example. That's right. This, I remember, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, the yeah. green, blue, green. Exactly. You know, yeah. Blue, green, blue, green. Yeah. In fact, yeah, there's exactly, the, exactly this diagram appeared there as well. So what we're talking about is uh, the distinction between linear precedence x precedes y and what we call hierarchical structure the word hierarchy is ambiguous in two different ways I'm, go I'm using the word hierarchy to mean this kind of stuff A kind of tree structure. And the relation in this precedes okay. is x um, is a constituent of of y. So when you have this relation, you have something here. There is a, there is an x here. There's a y here. Then you say x is a constituent of y. Or you can say um, y is composed of x and something, some z. So if you have a y here, sorry, y is composed of, yeah, y is composed of z and x. Okay, this is, in other words, what we're talking about here is not a precedence relation, but a part whole relation. So x is a part of y is what I'm talking about. That's, that's what I mean by hierarchical structure. Okay. So these are two fundamental relations, a part whole relation and a precedence relation are two things. But we also used words like this, determiner, noun, etc. That, that is a relation of category. So here we are talking about x is a member of category x. So when you say boy, boy is a noun, what you mean to say is boy is a member of the category or a special kind of set called noun. Category is a special kind of set with some whatever it is that you want to assign to it. Yeah. Examples of these would be? Okay, well, yeah, let me just write that and then, okay. yeah. So you have x is a member of, this is one type of relation, x precedes y, and the third is <coughs> x is a part of y. These are the three basic relations that you need. Well, you know, put in more of those, but initially this will be reasonably good. And let me show you how that works. Suppose you say that boy adores, let's go back to uh, an example, uh, these books. And suppose you say that this is a determiner, this is a noun, and together they form a unit. And we need some label for this. And I'm going to call it noun phrase. I'm not going to define any of them. You could say alpha, beta, gamma, if you wish. Okay. Uh, what does it mean to say determiner? What does it mean to say noun? What does it mean to say noun phrase? At this point, I'm sidestepping that question. And it's important sidestepping. Because what it means in substance comes from some other 
type of representation. So I'm not going to uh, do that. I'm going to go entirely by form, not the substance. I'm going to call this a verb again. You can't ask me what's a verb. This is just alpha, beta, gamma. This is a determinant. So what is important is that if I call this determinant, I call this also a determinant. That's important. Books, I call it noun. And whatever I call this, I will call same thing here. Noun phrase. And then I will say, these two together form a unit, which I will call verb phrase. And noun phrase and this verb phrase together, I will call a sentence. So there is a picture that I have drawn here. That picture can be written up in, in words like this. The sentence, the sentence, that boy adores these books. This sentence, so that this is sentence is expressed by the symbol here. Then, it says that this sentence is composed of this noun phrase and this verb phrase. Okay. So the next sentence, the next level would be uh, this sentence is composed of composed of is a part whole relation. The first one is a membership relation. Is a member of this whole expression is a member of the category S, and it is composed of. Uh, that boy and adores these books. So these two pieces. But then you have to assign these tables and you have to say this, this expression is a member of the category noun phrase. Category relation, membership. This is a member of the category verb phrase. Now you say this is composed of, of that and boy. That's the path whole relation. And then you say that is a member of the category determinant. This is a member of the category noun, and so on. So you can do this whole stuff. In, in terms of just ordinary prop propositions, you don't need the picture. The picture simply puts together all those propositions into a diagram, that's all. And the diagram, the formalism that I'm implying here, as well as here, is that this is a graph theoretic object or network. These are, these are nodes. <clears throat> and these are vertices, no, uh, arcs, edges, edges, yeah, uh, nodes, nodes versus vertices, and edges versus arcs, yeah. The terminology is uh, two different terminologies, same thing. But that's the, the the mathematical formalism. But the relations that are expressed by the mathematical formalism are these. Now, I have been so far. I have been talking about member of and part four. But I didn't say anything about the precedence relation that we started out with, x precedes y. You also have to say that this one precedes this one. <coughs> so this noun phrase precedes this verb phrase. This determiner precedes this, and so on. That is implicit here in this picture. Okay. So that, what I've written here is a description of that sentence, the structural representation of that sentence. Now, what about the laws? Laws are built on this structure. So what I'm going to say is that S, the category S is composed of, this arrow means is composed of uh, NP, noun phrase, and PP. The comma means I'm not stating the relative order. So this is a statement about category structure, structure of categories. 
then I will add to this the NP precedes BP. The advantage of separating these two is that there are languages in which this law applies, but here this will be reverse. So it gives me a way of talking about the differences between languages, what they have in common and what they, how they are different. Now I will say the NP is composed of a determiner, which is optional, uh, an adjective, which is also optional, and a noun. And you have to say that the if there is determiner that precedes the adjective, if there is adjective that precedes the noun. So I've stated the precedence relation this way, the part four relation this way. Then you have to say something about the verb phrase. Verb phrase consists of a verb and an NP. And again, verb precedes the NP. Now notice that up to this, this part, I have described the laws to generate this structure. What I haven't done is this relation. Now what I need is the lexicon that specifies the category. So you say boy is a noun. So now I have done this one. This is like a dictionary. That is a determiner. So I get this one. <clears throat> a dose is a verb. So I have a list of these words whose categories are specified. Notice I don't have to define nouns, I don't have to define verbs. If I have only one language, English, I don't need to have the definition. But the moment I come, go across languages, to say that this is a verb in English, it's also such, such and such is a verb in Hindi. Right. Um, then I have to say, what's a verb such that you can use the same word in English and Hindi and Malay and so on. Now I, I need definitions. Until then I don't. You need them to distinguish between those two themselves, right? Which one? Between a noun and a verb. You no, I simply assign these labels in the dictionary. That's sufficient. So you take out, take all the words which are nouns and then list them? Yeah, list them. Listing is okay. When a new word comes, you list that. By the way. It's exactly like, a how many words do you have in a dictionary? A pot potentially a dictionary can have many, many words. It can have thousand, it can be, you know. But then a dictionary has only a finite number of words. Very large is different from infinite. Yeah? Is it possible to have categorization which are large, higher order categories where the words are not like, right next to each other? So is it possible that that and like, the last two words of a sentence together form a category and then other category. I can't the think last two words of a sentence this form a category. The first word and the last word together form oh, a category. Oh, 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 okay. All right, you're talking, asking about this continuous units. So here, all the uh, units which form, the subunits which form one, one unit are adjacent to each other. You are asking the question, can they be non-adjacent across? Yes, the answer is yes. Those are the interesting cases. Will, and in fact, that's how do you deal with discontinuous units is a very important question in this approach. I'll give you some ways of dealing with those things. Uh, and if you are interested in biology, then of course, there, there are obvious questions that you can ask about biological structure as well. Yeah. So, there are words which are both nouns, verbs, and uh, Yeah. And, uh, so, now, uh, to say that mm. in a context that such a thing as a verb or a noun, wouldn't then we need a definition of this? Uh, no, you don't. You take, take, for example, measure or permit. Uh, there are two ways of doing this. You can say permit is a noun, 
or a verb. Right? This is how dictionaries do it. Another way of uh, doing it is to say there is a noun permit, there is also a verb permit. It just yes. happens to be pronounced the same way and spelled the same way. Yes, but how do I identify that given a sentence without a definition of a verb noun? You're simply stipulating those categories on the basis of the data that you get. Notice that you're constructing a grammar on the basis of data given to you. So I look at the behavior of some word like permit and I say, ah, permit, there is a, there is a noun permit in English and there's a verb permit in English. I'm stipulating it. I don't have to ask for definitions. What's the difference between noun and verb then? Like if you are... Look, uh, how do you, suppose we want to stipulate our heights. How will you do it? You just measure me and stipulate my height. You measure... Uh, Madhu stipulate his height. Why do you want to ask for a definition such that we can infer the heights? But so there is something the, common and something different. Yeah, at this point I am saying there is nothing that is inferable, this is simply arbitrary. The assumption is wrong, right? But if, you're, if English is the only language that you have, you don't, have, you don't need anything else. The difficulties arise when you use the same terminology across languages. But until we come to that state, until we move from English to some other language, the question that you're asking <coughs> doesn't exist. I think he's asking the question from the perspective of trying to evaluate a given sentence to check if it is correct. Ah, in I which see. Which case you would have to know yeah. if you know these laws uh, yeah. are satisfied. Yeah. And in which case you need to know what. Ah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so the issue that you're raising is the distinction between production algorithm and parsing algorithm. Okay, so what I've done here allows you to produce an infinite set of sentences. It's a production algorithm. Right? If you want a machine to generate a large number of sentences. You can just do this. Rules like this are usable. And the machine will say, okay, let me begin with S, and I will write this as NP and DP. Now it's, there is an NP, I will expand this as, should I use a determinant? No. Should I use an adjective? No. I just say no. So this gives you a production algorithm. And of course, there, there should also, I, I included only single sentence sentences. There are also sentences like, John believes that Mary is a pig. There's a one sentence inside a sentence. Or John opened the door and went out. Two sentences. So those things I haven't yet done. Once you put those things in, then you get a little more complex algorithm. I'm also not using structures like a noun phrase consists of a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase. This consists of a preposition and noun phrase. This consists of a noun phrase and prepositional phrase, and so on and so on and so on. This is the kind of structure that you need for sentences like, I saw, I saw a bird in the cage in the house near the river across the bridge in the, in the village. Right? This is the structure that I'm using. This is the structure of recursion. So I have it built in recursion here. But once you build in the recursion and all those other sophisticated uh, bells, you get a production algorithm that will be fine. Now, what about parsing? So, you're reading a text, and you want to decide whether the sentence given to you is grammatical or not. It's a reverse, a reverse case. What you do there is to, if you have these things in your dictionary, permit is listed as noun, permit is listed as verb, you will try different structures. So, it may be the case that if you try permit as a noun, it'll work. But if you try verb, then it will not work. So you have to try alternative structures. Then how is it a law? How is it? A law. The law, the, the law that I'm stating here is, is neutral to production algorithm and, and parsing algorithm. I'm stating the abstract thing that is used in both. Now, so the law is neutral to these two, these two algorithms. You didn't get my question. Like when you say a law, that means that 
uh, the words on what it contains follow that. Right. So now you are telling that there are different structures possible. One where I can use noun and one where I can use verb, and that would fix is correct. Not always. So, for instance, let me give you a concrete example. So, well, how would you distinguish between a counter example and uh, ah, something? okay. So, suppose I say I have a permit and I permit you to leave. Now, we know that in your lexicon, both these are possible. And so when you, one of the things that you might like to do is, what is this? That's a noun. What is this? That's a verb. What is this? A uh, determiner. What is this? Hmm. There are two possibilities. This can be a noun, or this can be a verb. Uh, likewise, this is a noun. Uh, I permit hmm, this noun or a verb. You is a noun. To is a preposition. And leave is a verb. Actually, leave is also a noun, but you know, I'm ignoring that part. Now you have to create a structure like this. OK? So the rule here says, uh, NP, if you have a noun, you can have these things and form an NP. So I need to create an NP here. So I'm applying this to NP goes to noun. This is, this is OK. I could do the same thing here. If it's a noun, I can use this. And the determiner, noun trace. And verb and NP is verb trace. And NP and VP is S. OK, my job is done. So that, with the interpretation that this is a noun, you get a grammatical structure. Suppose you use a V here. I can't get a structure with this set of rules. So if I try that path, uh, you can't get this determinant and verb together into an NP. So you say, OK, this couldn't be a verb. The same thing applies to the choice between these two. So that is how the, the uh, parsing algorithm works. Now, I've given you a very simplified thing. This is the toy grammar. And I have ignored all the complexities in computational linguistics. The actual reality is nothing like this. It's far more complicated. But you know, the toy grammar is OK when, you, uh, when you're doing the first step. This is, the, this is the toddler grammar. We can't run. We have to handhold and walk you know, very slowly. For Olympic running, you have to have far more sophisticated stuff. All this I'm going to actually abandon very soon. But this is a good way of getting a feel for what it is like to construct laws. So to develop that structure, yeah. you could never use these, these types of sentences. Look, one of the basic principles of science is when you begin to investigate something, you begin with the simplest possible. You ignore the complexities and deal with very, very simple things. Ignore as much complexity as possible. And gradually, once you have an account of simplest possible stuff, you gradually increase your complexity. If you look at the whole phenomena in, in nature and try to construct a scientific account, you'll be completely lost. So the way you deal with, for example, the falling of a dry leaf is to pretend that uh, there is nothing like air resistance that the world is without any air. And not only that, you're going to assume that the world has exactly two bodies. Because if you assume, that's what Newton did. If you assume there are three bodies and try to calculate the motion of three bodies, you get extraordinary complexity. So to, when you begin, you assume that there are only two, two bodies. Not only that, you assume, contrary to reality, that every body, including Earth, is a point mass. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 this, uh, it's just a point rather than the whole shape. And you calculate uh, the center of gravity as a kind of point and the distance between distances calculated in terms of. So we make so many abstractions, so many idealizations, 
in order to get to the heart of the basic laws. Then you can begin to complicate matters after that. Let's take this example. I have uh, mm. Now, here, we know that permit there is a noun. Mm. But if I was the novice and I was designing this, then how would I distinguish whether it's a counter example where, where it's a verb mm. or whether the verb is not possible? There is no recipe for that. You try both. You try both. You say it's a counterexample, therefore my laws are wrong. You change your laws. The other you say it is not a counterexample, I simply change something. Right? Um, so typically the linguist, or like any other scientist, tries to avoid the conclusion that my theory is wrong. What you do is, oh, I need to add some extra stuff. Okay. So it make it slightly more complicated, so keep doing that. And then when you keep doing that, what happens is, the theory that you get is so complex that it is, it is completely useless. Then you begin to see, okay, reality couldn't be that complicated. Reality has to be simple. Then you kind of clean the whole stuff, look for an alternative thing, and then you see, okay, what I thought was simply an additional complication, something that some extra frills and bizzles was actually you don't need any of that stuff. So it's a kind of um, judgment based on your prior experience. Experience meaning prejudice. But sometimes the prejudice doesn't work. At some stage, everybody has to accept, okay, you have gone too far with hacking. So every scientist hacks a little bit. I don't, I don't know of anybody who doesn't do that. And then you realize later, after about two years, okay, what I did two years ago was terrible. And you clean up your mess. That's the only way. Science is very conservative. So unless there is a strong reason to erase an entire edifice, it doesn't do that. What it does is to create some extra stuff on the edifice and see uh, what you can get out of it. And then, of course, after making it more and more complicated, it becomes so useless that you erase it. You, then you restructure the whole edifice. Such restructuring is fairly unusual. It happens only occasionally. Those restructurings happen, for example, in the transition between Newton and Einstein. Those are called scientific revolutions. But even they notice the restructuring is not the entire edifice, but some uh, restructuring in a, <coughs> in a major way. Uh, Einstein picked many of the Newtonian assumptions and built this edifice on those assumptions. Are these, um, they seem to me, that these are what I would call statistical laws. These are not, uh, uh, these are not... In, in, in the sense that you look at mm. various examples mm. and you tease apart what you think is common mm. and then you construct these rules right. and then you see if they hold universally in some mm. way. Yeah. Okay? But this is what you have obtained from statistics. Uh, not so far. So far, the assumption is that this is not deterministic. These are inviolable deterministic laws. Yes, I, but, but, but you know, where did you get the initial guess from? From the data. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so empirical. By, yeah, exactly. Empirical, but not statistical. I, 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 I'm using, uh, when I say statistical, I, I, I okay, actually fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. But is there, you know, the equivalent of a, um, you, you know, for, I, 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 let me give you a convoluted example for this. So if I were to ask the question, when does the sun rise on, um, what is this, on the 27th of August, mm -hmm. uh, I could do uh, observations. I sit, you know, awake mm. for 10,000 years, mm. exactly on the 27th of August, mm. and I record the time. Mm. So in 2016, I have a fairly good estimate. Yeah of when it rises. Yes. That, you know, is equivalent to, you know. In, in, in uh, no, actually, th no? that is not the case because just about everything that I did in order to build this stuff okay. is an act of imagination. I, I presented it as though it were kind of uniquely determined by the data. It's not, because I could have said, instead of doing this. No, no, no. The yeah. data over here are the many different sentences that are available to 
Yeah, so you some which I do look at data. Me. Yeah, but that is true. No, no. So I, you know, it's it's informed by the data, as opposed to yeah me trying to predict the time of sunrise based ah. on Kepler's laws. Okay. And you know the distance from the yeah. sun and earth. You know. Yeah. So so I you know I don't see the Keplerian law deduction ah. prevalent over here. Is yeah. there any? Yes. Sort? Yes. In fact. Uh, you, you are describing the distinction between moving from data to theory, how do you construct the theory, and then once you have the theory, how do you deduce the stuff? Mm, so No, I'm thinking of deducing the theory, not using the data, but from some principles. Uh, so, so if I were to imagine the theory of, a, of a, you know, the brain receiving information, or something mm. like that, I can say that the brain cannot receive two nouns consecutively. It has to be interspersed by, you know, data ah, okay. or something like that, right? right? Because I, I, you know, independently I hit upon this mm. from, you know, some theory of the brain, and I say I have to have this kind of a structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is inspired by data that I have. Observed. Yeah. Okay. That is inspired by. Yeah. You know, some functional aspect. Right. Okay. Let me see if I understand you right. Let me compare notes. What I'm trying to do is to construct an English grammar. At this point, I don't have a universal grammar. Sure. Once I have a universal grammar, I'm going to look at a new language, let's say Japanese. Mm -hmm. I have a universal grammar, so my decisions will be based on my universal grammar. Here, the decisions are based entirely upon the data that I get. I don't have a theory as such. I don't have a universal theory. But now, now that I have a universal theory, when I come across a new language, the task is trivial. I just do a few things here and there, and we'll get a new grammar. So if you are, what you're talking about is a second step. After we have a universal theory. Yeah, but you're also going to build the universal theory from yes. the from data. Initially you look at data. But but is there is there an aspect of having encountered a universal theory without Universal theories are co constructed by human imagination. Yeah. Right? Sure. So it could be scientific imagination, it could be mathematical imagination. But they're all creations of the human mind. Yeah. So once you have those imagined things, then you can constrain yeah. uh, your laws in terms of those things. Yeah. So for instance, here is, here is a classic case. When linguistics started, all the laws were categorical laws, no statistics, no counting, nothing. Discrete mathematics. So the very idea that you could use continuous mathematics was taboo. So when I was a grad student, when I suggested this, I had help from the community saying, what? You do, every, you do everything in terms of the number two. That's all that you have. You have plus and minus, nothing else. Now things have changed. People have started using probabilistic laws and statistics and so on. This was completely taboo in 1980. Unthinkable. Okay. This is like saying, you know, there is no God. You'll be punished immediately. Uh, pardon me? Oh, in many communities you'll be punished. Okay, you can do that here, but not. Uh, <laughs> uh, even if you get the law, like two nouns cannot be uh, simultaneously be comprehended by the brain and you build up an edifice based on that, even then you are building up on data. Sure. That would be I, an I, I, no, I realize that halfway through my question. There would be an alternative thing. It, but, but, but it is not but these data, it is different yeah. data. Uh, yeah. When you compare I, a, a, a I, agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that, I mean, even Kepler's laws were ultimately yeah. based on some observations, some yeah. data. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. But essentially the statement to make is that theories are constrained by the data. They are not determined by the data. Sure. Well, they are constrained by imagination. Actually. Yeah. Well, imagination and data together. That's right. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. In fact, there was a time when it was unthinkable, unimaginable that the Earth is not the center of the universe. What? It's not? Hmm? Oh, you didn't know? I this was, the it the was the there in uh, Fox News yesterday. <laughs> This is the latest news, Earth is not the center. Yeah. So that has to be true. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Right. Seven. Seven one, so six to seven. Isn't that neat? Okay, let me go turn. I hope it is not turned off by itself this oh okay. The red thing still works.